Justin Trudeau was in Vancouver yesterday for his first appearance since he approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion by Kinder Morgan. British Columbians are split on this project pretty much right down the middle, so it's no surprise the Prime Minister had no public appearances yesterday, as he certainly would have faced organized professional protests from the numerous foreign-funded activist groups in BC. So instead, the Prime Minister held a few select media appearances, and I know it may shock you, but sitting down with rebel media was not one of those select appearances. However, the Prime Minister did do a Facebook Live event with the Vancouver Sun and Vancouver Province editorial board. So I thought I would go over some of the topics, some of the answers and comments that Justin gave yesterday. Of course, I was a little concerned going into it to the extent that the media party journalists over there would challenge and push Trudeau, not only on the pipeline decision, but other important issues as well. And despite only one obvious social justice warrior reporter, I actually give full marks to the editorial board yesterday for asking some tough questions. But let's begin with the most popular topic of the day yesterday. No surprise, the pipeline decision dominated the discussion. As I have been saying for months now, the Liberals are caught in the middle of this, on this topic. On one hand, they saw their best electoral fortunes in BC in decades in 2015, mostly due to his courting of typical NDP and Green Party voters with his commitment to do something about climate change. But on the other hand, Trudeau has to do something to get GDP growth going in our country and help a struggling Alberta economy. That balancing act was on full display again yesterday. Um, I think first of all, understanding that Canada is uh, a country that works because uh, provinces do a good job of looking out for their own, uh, their own interests while we have a federal government that's looking out uh, for our collective interests, for our national interests at the same time. Uh, but I, I, I definitely reject the, the idea that um, in any decision there's a uh, either or in terms of who you're picking to support or not. I mean what's good for the country, what's good for BC, what's good for Alberta, uh, they all intersect tremendously on this one. I've been very, very clear since the beginning uh, that we need to both protect the environment and build a stronger economy at the same time. Uh, and I haven't seen any uh, political party anywhere across the country that says we don't have to do those two things as well. I actually think that some moderate swing voters in BC will accept that kind of response from the Prime Minister. But he will get nowhere talking like that with the hardcore anti-oil sands, anti-energy, anti-everything crowd here in BC. But after that, it kind of went downhill for Trudeau. When he began being pressed about the anticipated opposition to the project, he just started blaming Stephen Harper and the previous Conservative government over and over and over again. Take a look. We tried that uh, uh, for the past 10 years and we didn't get any protection of the environment and we didn't get any pipelines built either. When the previous government was showing absolutely no leadership on the environment, refused uh, to do anything around putting a price on carbon, the previous government didn't do anything on the environment and weren't able to do much on the economy. So instead of answering questions about what he would do in the face of protests and people like Elizabeth May and Burnaby Mayor Derek Corgan, who said that they will force police to arrest them in order to stop the pipeline, Justin Trudeau thinks that it's a good time to slam the previous Conservative government who, quote, didn't do anything on the environment and were, quote, able to do much on the economy either. What pure partisanship? Let's take a look at those claims. First, let's look at emissions under the Tories. They took office in 2006 and Canada was producing 738 megatons of greenhouse gas emissions. But by 2014, that number was down to 732 megatons. And it wasn't as if this reduction came at the expense of the economy either. If you recall, the New York Times put out an editorial shortly before the last election that showed that Canada has the world's strongest middle class. But let's get back to Justin, because in about two minutes here, you're going to find out his complaining about the previous government's policies quite ironic. The second issue I was very pleased to see raised was the controversy surrounding the Liberals and Trudeau hosting fancy fundraisers where Chinese millionaires are given access to the Prime Minister in exchange for political donations to the Liberal Party and even to the Trudeau Family Foundation, when it can only be described as something far too similar to the pay-for-play scheme the Clinton Foundation was running. Here, have a listen to the Prime Minister dodge this question and deny any wrongdoing at all. 
That, 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 the other side of that is uh, something that we have, and you, you say, you know, why aren't you being transparent? The fact is we are absolutely transparent about it. There is total accountability. There is total openness to that. You cannot make a donation to a political party in this country uh, and not uh, have your name appear on a list. Uh, there is, right now, uh, total accountability on that. And at the federal level, and you guys should know this here in BC, we have uh, among the strictest rules on fundraising that are out there. You cannot uh, accept uh, donations above uh, a, a certain limit uh, from I individuals, a very strict limit uh, from uh, individuals. Uh, and there are no corporate donations, there are no union donations, uh, and there is full accountability. So uh, yes, I understand that there, uh, you know, there, are, there are issues and questions around this, and that's fine because, of course, uh, you know, people need to make sure that we're uh, following all the rules. But the fact is, Canadians can be reassured that we are following all the rules uh, around uh, our very rigid uh, political fundraising system. I mentioned earlier how ironic it was to hear the Trudeau government repeatedly criticize the previous government's policy. But you notice how openly he praised the current federal rules surrounding fundraising? The fact we have limits on individuals capped at $1,500 a year and no union or corporate donations altogether? But aside from the fact that the Liberals are bending those rules to the brink with sources telling me that the Liberals have ways of spreading out $1,500 to numerous names despite the fact they may originate from a few wealthy donors. But these current rules, the strictest in the country, were brought in by none other than the Harper Conservatives, of course. I wonder if Justin even knew whose policy he was praising when he talked so glowingly about that law. The next question was one I was absolutely floored to hear asked. Justin Trudeau was asked point blank if he would consider cutting immigration levels. I gotta tell you, the journalist who asked this was Douglas Todd, and he has my respect because we know in this politically correct culture we live in, accusations of being xenophobic are thrown out there at the mere mention of doing something about the problems with immigration. But watch as Justin's smug yet predictably globalist response to this question that many Canadians have concerns about. Uh, religion, diversity, and migration. So it's an immigration question. And I've learned the last couple of years that your dad was the last guy to cut immigration rates in the late 70s, I think. And he did so because the economy was stagnating and he didn't want more people putting more pressure on limited jobs. So my question for you is, whether you would ever consider cutting immigration rates because of stagnant wages, and particularly in Vancouver, the thing that everybody talks about is the housing crisis, where that is part of the pressure on prices. Is, uh, 40, you know, 90% of immigrants to BC come to Vancouver. Far be it from me to second guess uh, the decisions my father might have made in, <laughs> in the 1970s. But I think uh, we're at a place right now where we understand maybe it's the aging demographic, maybe it's the challenges around uh, 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 you know, growth in our economy, uh, that uh, drawing in immigrants is going to be an essential, essential part of creating economic opportunity and creating benefit. Uh, there, is, there is an understanding that um, bringing in uh, new Canadians is an essential part of how we're going to grow the economy. So, we have to be very thoughtful about how we manage immigration and how we uh, both uh, bring in the right people and empower people to be successful when they're here. Uh, but I think we're on a track towards uh, increasing immigration over time. You heard it, quote, if anything, we need to increase immigration, unquote. That is a comment that is simply not backed up by facts or public opinion, but one backed up by the belief that new immigrants will be mostly Liberal Party voters in as few as three years. If you're interested, I would suggest watching the whole 45-minute interview. There are a couple other topics, including marijuana legalization and the fentanyl crisis that Trudeau spoke about, but I didn't get to with you today. Let me know your thoughts on his interview yesterday. You can email me, Christopher at therebel.media. And I'm wishing you and yours a very Merry Christmas from everyone here at Rebel Media. I'm Christopher Wilson. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't done it already, click subscribe on that YouTube channel. And if you really like what we're doing here at The Rebel, well, for $8 a month, you can get premium content not available on that YouTube channel. And there are full-length programs from Ezra Levant, Faith Goldie, Lauren Southern, and more. Check it out.